Welcome to Health System CIO's interview with Tom Mustak, Senior Director and Head of Systems, Cloud, and Biomed Security with Mount Sinai Health System. I'm Anthony Guerra, Founder and Editor-in-Chief. Tom, thanks for joining me. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Great. Uh, lots of good stuff to talk about today, Tom. Uh, can we start out? You want to give me an overview of your organization and your role? Sure. So we are one of the major providers, uh, healthcare providers here in the New York City area, uh, consisting of eight hospitals and uh, well over 200 outpatient clinics and offices. Uh, we're also a research and learning hospital. So a lot going on, a lot of diversity in, uh, in the environment, both from a technology standpoint and the services offered. Uh, my, my role, I'm responsible for the cybersecurity of, of all our devices and um, helping to close down the, the many vulnerabilities and concerns that uh, have been in the medical, uh, medical vertical for a number of years that are getting a lot of attention now. Certainly are getting a lot of attention. So um, quite an interesting title, Head of Systems, Cloud, and Biomed Security. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you see those all as, as almost different buckets that you have to cover? Or is it sort of, in your mind, is it one thing? Um, well, they're, they're, they're different. They're, from a technology standpoint, there's a lot of similarities because bits and bytes are bits and bytes. Uh, but from maturity levels of, of security, they're, they're different buckets. Uh, the traditional uh, iron that we have, you know, main, mainframes, desktops, laptops, all, all that stuff is, is pretty well covered and mature. Um, the new stuff in our environments, obviously, is you know, the big push for the cloud. And uh, medical devices, IoT devices, um, medical and IoT devices, I think, have, um, have grown uh, in, in footprint tremendously over the past decade. And, and we kind of didn't even realize how much technology crawled into our lives. Very good. So grown, uh, certainly, over the years. Um, <clears throat> So you have in your your responsibilities your responsibility for for the cybersecurity of the medic this was on your LinkedIn profile the medical Internet of Things I've yes. been talking to other people where Internet of Things is certainly much wider than medical so do you have are there other individuals or another person who deals with the non medical connected devices uh, we we do I mean we we have a pretty pretty broad team and uh, we we try to divide up the work we you know, we collaborate where we can and where there's overlap uh, but we we specialize in our areas to address the specific security concerns with specific device types and we'll get a little more into business continuity planning but you're going to have very specific uh, business continuity planning for medical devices. Uh, that should have issues and need to be taken offline. Is that an area that you also uh, do a lot of work? Yes. Yeah. Can, definitely tell me experience. about that. Um, well, with with medical devices, I mean, it depends on the device type. I mean, with with the bigger devices like an MRI, a CT, um, that that's big iron. You you can't move those when when they stop working or if they're uh, out of commission. You have to find a different location with different equipment, right? Um, with the smaller devices, you can swap them out uh, fairly easily and have redundancy, like you know, infusion pumps, um, patient monitors, things like that. You can swap that equipment out within a location. But the bigger the bigger devices, there there is no swapping out a an MRI. Now, not in a day, certainly. Yeah, um, you know, I'd spoken to a CIO at a different health system, and she see she had this. Um, sort of scenario in her head that was concerning of having to take, for example, all the infusion pumps out of, you know, what do I do? What do I do if there's a cyber event where they're all possibly compromised? Not definitely, but we don't know and we don't want to keep working them. So what do I do? So what are your thoughts around that kind of scenario? Well, I mean, with, with infusion pumps, you can always, um, that, that's always a, a fast moving component in, in a health system. I mean, there, there are tons of, of rental pumps that people use all the time because of surge capacity. Uh, we have multiple facilities, so we can we can borrow from other facilities and you know take 10% from each one to replenish and get some rentals. So there's a lot of different approaches you can take. Um, you, you can also 
eliminate some in, in some instances I would I would expect the clinicians can go back to a normal drip bag and and more supervision of that. Um, so there, there is no there's no straight simple answer for what am I going to do because the environment changes so quickly. You don't know what's going to be available um, for your your use at that time. You don't know what capacity is going to be across the system at each location. Um, you you don't know what the rental company is going to have going on. You know, let, let's say a particular brand was was hit by something major, and we all jump for them, and, and we all suck up that supply very quickly. Then it's first come first serve because there, there's not a full replacement for everything any everywhere. So it, it's almost like there's so much you can do. You know running out scenarios in your mind there's only so much you can do and then we're just going to have to figure it out because there's there's a billion different scenarios yeah. right and there so it's hard to have a playbook for each one because there's too many yeah does that make yeah. sense yeah. yeah absolutely i mean and obviously we we also engage with our our colleagues in in the office of emergency management every every mature health system has a separate emergency management function that takes care of the overall enterprise and, and how we deal with an emergency. So they deal with the clinical side and, and, you know, what do we divert? What do we cancel as far as procedures? Um, so de definitely, you know, technology has a, has a, a place at the table and we discuss, you know, how we can support, how quickly we can come back and, and all that. But ultimately the, the clinical decisions are going to be on the clinical side. The, the system wide function will see, you know, what, what our options are, what can we do? You know, can, can we go, does going into diversion or moving patients around us help us with the situation? So it's, it's a very complex and um, un, I would say un, unnerving situation for a health system to deal with, right? Because of all the complexity, because people don't stop coming in the doors. I mean, if an emergency happens, and if it's regional, it, it just keeps coming. So this is very, very interesting. Uh, and this is an area that I've been sort of looking at a lot, this sort of business continuity planning, uh, the roles of, of cyber, uh, and then you mentioned emergency management. So that's the overarching entity in a health system that's going to make sure tornado, this, that, Correct. terrorist all, attack, all anything, right? Okay. Uh, cyber is going to, uh, and you tell me if I'm wrong, because you can't just be passive in cyber and say, well, emergency management is going to deal with all business continuity. And so I don't really need to worry about that in a sense. This is my me saying, me theorizing mm -hmm. that it's very important for cyber to be proactively meeting with emergency management and explaining to them the different scenarios that could happen from a cyber point of view. And so, OK, you need to understand emerge because they may not know. They may right. have no conception of what could happen in a cyber event, how it would impact operations. So you need to tell them and say, here are some scenarios. Now you emergency management need to go work with the clinicians and take what we, because we're not going to do it. I'm not going to sit down with the physicians and say, oh, here's what could happen. What are you guys going to do when you have to go to paper? Tell me your thoughts around that. How does it actually yeah. play out? Correct. I mean, there, there was, um, there was an instance I believe it was about two years ago of a hospital somewhere in the U S that had to go back to paper. Yeah. And when the day came, they didn't have the paper. <laughs> yeah. They, they didn't, they didn't think it through. So we, we have, you know, in, in all these organizations, we have a lot of bright people with a lot of great experience, but the communication is vital that we actually talk through with each other, how we see things unfolding, because as a technologist, I can come to you and say, well, we're going to do X, Y, and Z and think it's all going to be great. But now when, when I have to involve others that actually have to work within that plan that I developed, they have a different, different scenario or different outlook or they may not have the, uh, the resources that I'm assuming they have. So it's really important that you, you do desktop planning, work through them all and, and really talk through the what ifs. And a lot of times I, when, when we go through these uh, tabletops, I, I like to have a little fun with them and tell people, you know, don't, don't be afraid to challenge each other. It's not about embarrassing each other. It's about surfacing all the different what ifs, making it a little bit uncomfortable. I mean, let, let's not just walk a straight path because that happy path is not always going to happen you know, when, when we need it. So let's have those what if scenarios. Let's challenge each other a little bit and get uncomfortable. And that's how we learn and, and we evolve. Great, great points. Um, I still want to get a little bit more in terms of 
uh, in detail in terms of understanding cyber's role, whether it's the CISO or you're someone in, in your role, what is, in your mind, what is your responsibility for initiating or driving or leading? Where do you, what do you have to say to yourself? Okay, at least I did this. At least I called this meeting. At least I told these people I tried. And maybe I didn't get the engagement that I thought I needed. Well, I don't know what else to do. I, I don't know. You know, I'm sure in some health systems, there are cyber folks hitting that wall of, I cannot get the engagement I need, maybe to do the right tabletop or to get the people at the tabletop. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's important to to keep the discussion going, keep, you know, never give up, keep the awareness going, keep people aware of things that are happening in the news and how they're relevant to your organization. You know, it might be it might be a similar structure or architecture that you're using to this other organization that had an event. You might be using the same technologies. Right. And you know, it's important to demonstrate to people that this is real. I mean, we we all like to uh, you know, watch a movie or or some Netflix series in our downtime, and and we see these scenarios play out. I think one of the most famous ones there was the one movie where uh, I forget what TV series it was, but the the president's pacemaker was attacked, and people look at that and say, well, yeah, that that can't happen. That that's all Hollywood, and and it's exaggerated. And when you play through some of these scenarios, people look at them and say, well, they're not. They're not realistic. It can't happen. But if you really dig in the news and you're focused on it, there's a lot of stuff that's happened to us, you know, over, over the past you know, three, four years as as a uh, as a uh, society that we always said you know, could never happen. I mean, if you look at the medical side, COVID. I mean, who the hell? Who, who would imagine that COVID would ever happen and we'd be locked in our homes? You know, we we never thought that people would be attacking hospitals from a cyber standpoint, but they're doing it. Uh, for various reasons. Sometimes we're just a, uh, a casualty and, and they don't know what they're hitting, but other times we're, we're a direct target. Yeah, I did. I spoke to one CISO who, who talked about doing some tabletops and uh, some of the people involved said, this is ridiculous. This scenario is too outlandish. And he said, well, this just happened two months ago at another health exactly. system, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's important to keep that relevant, you know, that understanding in front of people so that they know, uh, you know, that place that that had this happen, they were using technology X version seven, and we have that same thing, or or maybe we're we're even a version behind. You know, right. you, you never know. Right. Um, so it's important to keep people aware, let them know that you know this is real. We're not exaggerating it. We can't address all risks. But we can manage risk, right, With, within our, our context of our environment and our resources. Um, and you need to prioritize, you know, what, what's going to give me the most bang for my buck and make me the most secure. So I know one of the things um, you've written that you focus on is education of stakeholders regarding the cyber risks of connected medical devices. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any general approach you take or advice you can give to others on how you handle that education? So I, I like to... Uh, within the, the group that I'm, I'm working with, look at the population devices that they have, look at the known risks and vulnerabilities and what's been happening with them, and then talking through what are we doing to make sure X cannot happen in our environment? Or if it did happen, how would we react? You know, how, how could you deal with losing this device for you know, an amount of time? Um, I think a great example is, is patient monitors, right? One, one of the things that patient monitors or, or, and many medical devices give us is efficiency to be able to support more patients with less staff, right? You'll, your nurse ratios change depending on, obviously, the, the illness level of the, mm -hmm. the patient and then with the technology that you have. So you can have a nurse's station where you have one person sitting there watching 20 patients at a high level that are you know, moderately ill, and you take that away that one nurse can no longer do that job. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with it? Do you have replacements? Can you get them up and running quickly? Do you have trained staff that you can get up on that floor quickly to take care of people? Um, so you, you need to think through all those different scenarios. Where, where am I going to get the staff? It's not just throwing bodies at it. They have to be certified. They have to be, uh, they have to have credentials to get into the system. They need to know their way around to know where different things are. You, you can't just take any live body and throw them in the room and say, go to work. Yeah, it's not mm -hmm. a, a simple job. So you're trying to get them to think through these scenarios. Correct. And, and how will you deal with it? And, and that helps them 
I mean, they're going to think of their workflows and their downtime procedures. How do they need to address it? Because now I'm showing you that this is real. These things have happened to other organizations. So they're going to think about when this happens, if it happens, how would I deal with it? And it also helps us on the IT side to get resources uh, dedicated to, you know, to step up our technology, to step up our processes and, and improve. Uh, but if if there is no discussion, there's no dialogue, it, it's kind of like the old, the tree falls in the forest. Right. Did it did it make a sound? No, I didn't hear it. Everything's fine. I don't hear anything, right? Are you talking about having them come up with a specific deliverable? Or is it maybe their operations leader that you are suggesting, hey, we're going to have a great discussion here. I would suggest you come up with a a white, uh, some sort of plan. Like, let's just not have a discussion and come up with some ideas and brainstorm and it goes from there. You're not saying give me the plan. I want to see it. But are you are, are you saying I think you should you guys need to come up with something concrete? Well, it's 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 a collaboration. Mm -hmm. it, it's to raise that awareness, make sure everybody understands what can happen and what mm -hmm. those probabilities are. And then we each go away within our workflows to improve them. Mm -hmm. And in, it's an iterative process. We keep coming back to the table and keep practicing and walking through them to say, okay, my SLAs are this, I can restore this function in this, in this manner based on these assumptions. What's the probability of me having all those things lined up? You know, with, if I need rental equipment or whatever, what's the probability of that being in place? If it's fairly good and then you, you may not need as much of a crutch on the other side, but you still need your plan B, plan C, plan D. Um, you, you can't stop at plan B. Uh, because things, when they start unfolding, they, they can they can snowball on you, uh, especially in a, a metropolitan region like New York City. I mean, there, there's so much. Even, for example, if we were to go into diversion, I mean, New York City has a very small footprint, you know, size wise. But try to get from, you know, from Harlem down to Lower Manhattan during the middle of rush hour. It it can take you to a you know, yeah. even, even though it's a three or four mile stretch, you might be quicker running. <laughs> oh, hundred, a hundred percent, a hundred, hundred percent. You're gonna hit, you're gonna hoof it. Yeah. You yeah. know. I, yeah. I mentioned earlier, I, I had a uh, commute to Jersey for a long time. When I started that commute at the beginning of my career, it was a 35, 40 minute drive. And toward the end of my career, as that area got more populated, it was taking me almost three hours to get home, especially if there was a Yankee game going on. Oh my God. And and it, it just became unbearable. Yeah, I, I I commuted in and out of New York City for 10 years from New Jersey. So I know, uh, yeah. you know, through 9-11 and the blackout and, and all those kind of things. So I certainly yeah. know uh, the challenges that can come up. Yeah. Um, the, the, the big joke w with my family was when they'd ask me, when are you going to get home? I'd say anywhere from 45 minutes to infinity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then <laughs> and then you get to the point where you go home and it's time to go to bed and then you got to get up and go to work. And exactly. You say, what was yeah. the point of all that? Yeah, so, yeah. yes, <laughs> commuting into New York City can be quite challenging for sure. Yeah. Uh, I want to let me put an open ended question in front of you, see where you want to go with it. What are some of the trends you're watching? They could be threats you want to make sure your organization can handle or technologies you think may want to leverage that you say, you know, I think my colleagues might want to have this stuff top of mind. Um, I, I would say two of the most concerning ones are. Um are the, the quantum technology being able to break passwords very, very quickly. I mean, that's coming down the pike on, on us all very quickly, uh, as well as um, AI and, and where AI can lead us. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of hype in the news about ChatGTP and some of the other services and, and how they give you these very well-structured responses and people are questioning, you know, if, if I ask it to do something unethical, will it do it currently? and, and in the experiments I've run with it, if you ask it to do something that's unethical, it tells you that it has this moral engine built into it and it won't do it. Um, but everything, everything with technology seems to be a matter of time. You know, when all the things they say can't be broken, can't be done, it, it's it's dropping the gauntlet and people start going out there and trying to do it. Eventually, somebody will find a, a crack in the armor somewhere. Yeah. So you want to stay on top of that stuff, and and you're you're testing it. Um, and I, I'm assuming that would be something you would recommend to your colleagues that you need to get in there and play, so to speak, and yeah, see what yeah. this stuff can do. It'll give you a better idea of what may be coming at you. Yeah. I mean, that, that's something that I've always uh, done throughout my career as new technologies came out. 
Um, I, I was always not, not so much an early adopter from putting it into production, but an early adopter from playing with it, tinkering mm -hmm. with it. Let's see what it can do. You know, is it, is it marketing hype or does this stuff really have potential that it's going to hit the marketplace one day and, and change things? Uh, it, it's just amazing the, the stuff that AI can do. And we're seeing virtual reality and these headsets that people are using for training and different things. Um, so there's a lot of good potential, but, but every technology that comes out um, is a double-edged sword. As, as much good as it can do in, in the wrong hands, not to sound cliche from you know, one of these superhero movies, it, it has the power to do just as much evil in the hands. Yeah, I don't know if it comes up too much in uh, you know trying to protect medical devices, but it probably does in other areas of your work. And um, the point that I've had other folks make to me is it is still much easier for um, these nefarious actors to, uh, especially maybe with chat GPT, to put together some sort of social engineering phishing campaign and basically through, you know, those kind of activities, get someone to give up a password and compromise their identity versus hacking an infusion pump. That's yeah. much more complex. You have a, So you're going to see a lot more of that lower hanging fruit than mm. the higher and more technology savvy attacks. What are your thoughts around that? Well, de definitely social engineering um, and, and leveraging the human's ability to make an error is, is yeah. always going to be a very um, a very frequently exploited you know, end point, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, no matter how well educated we are and well versed we are in technologies, you, we get tired, we get distracted. We're trying to do seven things at once, and, and it's easy to make that mistake. And and I, I always pick up on this during the holidays or when there's a natural disaster of some kind, that there are groups that start picking up and starting to social engineer things immediately using that as a premise. So it could be the um, the earthquakes happening in Turkey or the war in Ukraine, and, and they know that people have strong emotions tied to this. Or during the holidays when uh, we're all waiting for those packages that we ordered too late, and you'll get a text message that says your package is undeliverable. Right. You, you freak out a little bit because you're mm -hmm. like, oh, God, you know, my, my significant other's package isn't going to come in time. And you click on that link and then you might get distracted and go away while your machine is now compromised. So any one of us can make that error. Um, so that that's the, the biggest thing that I'm concerned with, the social engineering. And, you know, as much information that is, that's available about our organizations, about our leadership and and, and us as individuals People can learn a lot about you online if you're not careful and structure things to take advantage either of your, yourself or someone that you're working with that you know, works closely with you. They'll call you up and they'll say, you know, uh, Anthony told me to give me give you a call and, you know, can you cut this check or approve this invoice because he's, you know, he's tied up and this vendor is really angry. So you'd really appreciate it. And depending on how they stage it, you know, and, they may say like, oh yeah, I, I know this was important. You know, if it's 99% accurate, they may not question that last 1% mm -hmm. and they'll click go and, and then it's all over. Yeah, so you just have to be super vigilant. And I guess that's part of the training yeah. is, you know, slow down before you yeah. do certain things and all yeah. that. Yeah, I, I always tell people, don't, don't be afraid to challenge authority to verify something. If somebody, even if they're screaming at you, I've had people screaming in my face, <laughs> you know, beat red, you know, look, looking like they want to have a, uh, a fist fight, but it's like, just give me two minutes, you know, take a breath. I'll, I'll go take care of it for you. And then on the back end, you go and you do your verification and 99% of the time it's going to be legitimate, but you do have to do those checks. And sometimes that, that pressure, that urgency is, is a red flag, yeah. right? Sometimes that's the tell, like yeah. this person wouldn't be, you know, this intense about this. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, if, if you're in a, an organization that's tight on resources and, and overworked, that, that might be the norm, that there is a lot of pressure in the environment, right? Yeah, so right. if they happen to pick an environment that's a high-stress environment and they come in with that approach, people, people react, well, they'll be more accepting of that pressure saying, well, yeah, this, this is how we work. Yep. You know, things come down hot and heavy you know, real fast. Let's talk a little bit more about the device vendors. Um, one of the other things in your profile was you collaborate with the device manufacturers. Um, I saw you actually worked for GE Healthcare. So you were on the device right. side. So yes, that gives you incredible perspective that a lot of um, IT professionals are not going to have. 
I recall uh, a discussion with a CIO who who said she was having a lot of trouble, I believe, with the device vendor. She wanted to make a change. I don't remember the details, but she wanted to do something to the, the device from a cybersecurity perspective. Mm -hmm. They would not allow it. She felt that was creating patient safety risk. Um, I guess, and, I, and they have their reasons, right? We have to understand where they're coming from. Absolutely. There are certain things they're not allowing you to do for good reason, although they, it may feel constricting. Mm -hmm. But I'd like your overall thoughts on the dynamics between uh, the IT professionals at the health systems and the medical device manufacturers. What is your advice for having a positive working relationship with your vendors in that area? And, and can it be frustrating sometimes for security professionals? It, it can absolutely be very frustrating. Uh, the, the outlook for traditional IT folks is they, they want the speed, they want the expediency, they see that a vulnerability is announced. If it happens to be a Windows device, there may be a patch already available. And if it's traditional IT, you're gonna pump that out you know, within a day or two and patch your, your whole enterprise. If it's a medical device running that same version of Windows, you can't go take that, that patch and apply it yourself. Um, and, and having that discussion and telling people you can't do it because they're looking at it from the traditional standpoint of, well, the machine's in front of you, the patch is in your hands, why can't you apply it? I just did it to 30,000 servers. You know? But the, the, um, the complexity on the medical device side is the liability and who owns that liability. And the manufacturer is saying no because they're on the hook and they've got the device certified with the FDA and other entities saying it functions in a certain way, they tested it under certain conditions mm -hmm. and they put their stamp of approval on it. You know, they attest absolutely this is how it works. Now, if you come in as, a, as an outsider, even though it's your device and you put something on it, well, you've tampered with it, right? It's, it's no different than if you buy a car and you go out and you put a, uh, a custom component on it, you put a custom stereo in and you go back to the manufacturer and say, I have a short. They're going to say, well, you, you monkeyed with it. You did something. It's your fault now. You own it. Go deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, that's a simplified example I mean, where, where you're just talking about a simple car. But now in, in the medical environment, the clinical environment, if you did something to it and something happens to a patient, it, it may not have anything to do with the device, but we're, we're a very litigious society and people are going to sue everybody and they're going to say, well, if you didn't mess with that device, there wouldn't be a question on the device now. So it, we really have to be very careful with how we do it. But the, the manufacturers are starting to come around. I really noticed in the past year that that engagement is, is much better than it ever was. And they're understanding that they need, do need to patch these devices. I mean, they're getting a lot of heat from all the healthcare organizations across the country. And, and what I've always said to my friends on the manufacturer side is, if you don't do this, somebody else will. It's a competitive world. So you're going to see foreign competitors come in and start eating your lunch because they're going to come in with patchable operating systems mm. with to date uh, security features. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you can't focus only on the clinical uh, functions of the device anymore. You have to look at a more holistic uh, standpoint of the, the environment it's going to be working in and what the expectations are from the HDOs as customers to say, now I do have to secure it quickly. I do have to react quickly when, uh, when uh, vulnerabilities come out. Uh, and I mean, ultimately, the, the solution that we have right now for a lot of these things that are unpatchable and, un, and un, uh, unserviceable from the manufacturers is to, um, to segregate them on the network, to lock them down mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the ports, protocols, and IPs that they need to talk to, that we know that they need to talk to. But that that's still not you know it's not a hundred percent. It still has some you know some uh, vulnerabilities in that you don't have traditional um, XDR software or, or endpoint protection on a lot of these devices that other PCs do. Where if there's an anomaly, the software will pick it up and it'll stop it. We're we're just limiting to saying you now have three doors to get into this device from, but they're still doors and they're not monitored. Right. So it's better than nothing, but it's not Correct. the ideal. It's it's Correct. certainly not Correct. a, hey, no worries, we can just do this. Correct. I mean, ultimately, you can also take some devices offline, depending on what utility you're, you're getting out of it. Uh, but that makes things difficult again, because a lot of this connectivity came in for remote serviceability and remote monitoring, where you know they can help clinicians through an issue on a device, 
without coming on site. So that takes minutes to deliver as a solution, as opposed to I've got to dispatch it to a technician. When he's free, he's going to get in his car. He's going to drive through midtown traffic for an hour and a half, and then he'll show it to you. So it, it, there's there's a lot of efficiency that gets lost if you start taking connectivity away. Well, as you said, the device manufacturers may be getting better, but they're still going to say, hey, we've got this FDA issue. So mm -hmm. as much as we want to you know, get with the times, so to speak, yeah. uh, we've still got... <laughs> There have to be changes on that side as well. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, and one, of, one of the things that I try to introduce in dialogues all the time between the manufacturers and the government ent entities I work with is we, we need to kind of draw a line in the sand to say, okay, going forward, we're going to do these things to make things more secure and collaborate. And we have standards moving forward. But there's a ton of legacy behind us that is not going to go away for a very long time. So let's just, you know, Put, put down our guns and say, this is a problem we all need to fix together. Mm -hmm. And you know, let's look at how we're approaching liability and who's responsible for what and know that we're coming to the table with the best intentions to deal with the mess that we have. I mean, there's a big legacy mess out there and, and I don't blame anyone for it. It's just the way that the, the world evolved. We didn't have these threats five years ago. So we, we need to look at it and say, okay, everybody bring your brains to the table and what's the best way to approach this? What's the least intrusive way for the device? And, and let's get them secured to the best of our ability collaboratively. And we're not so much concerned or we don't see so much of, of bad actors monkeying with the actual devices to, you know, say, Hey, I want to, I want to hurt someone that's on this infusion pump. You know uh, it's more of an entryway to get into the network and move laterally from there. Is that accurate? Correct. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. So I mean they're they're using them as entry points. And and a lot of times I, I believe that they don't even know where they're getting to. They just find an open doorway and they're crawling through. They don't know what's on the other side of it, whether there's a patient there, whether there's a medical device. They just know they're in the network mm -hmm. and they start squirreling around. Um, but it, it, as far as targeting somebody with a specific device, I mean, there there is a a high level of expertise that's needed to do that and a high level of knowledge about the device and the person at the other end of it. And if, if they were to you know, attack a head of state, they would need to know what devices they have. You know, going back to the, um, the pacemaker example, mm -hmm. to exploit a pacemaker, you need to be within a reasonably close proximity because they're Bluetooth based. You need to know the make model serial number. Mm -hmm. It's There's a lot of other ways to, yeah. to address problem for a lot less money and a lot less knowledge it doesn't take a rocket scientist to do it so that that's where i say you know it it with with everything people look for the path the the path of least resistance it, it works with water it works with electricity it works with people also um if there's an easier way we'll find it and and no one wants to go through all that trouble to try to hurt someone they're going to find a cheaper way to do it but it but it makes a better netflix show it's it's an amazing Netflix show. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to be? Have you been a consultant on any of these programs? <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> not yet. They're going to call you. That's great. Uh, Tom, let's have just uh, wind up. Um, final piece of advice for someone in your position at a comparable sized health system doing the same work you're doing. And you're saying, hey, from all my experience of all these years, this is this is a, a little piece of advice to take away. Um. I said, just always you know, maintain your focus, know what your end game is, know what's in, in your, in your organization. You know, it, hopefully people by this point are, are getting very good at discovering what devices are sitting on their network, who owns them uh, and, and be inclusive, get, get the clinicians involved, let get your, uh, your building services staff involved, get your biomed folks involved, your IT folks. And some things that you know, may, may seem like a, a, a monumental challenge to one group may become a much smaller problem when you involve the others because of the diverse experiences and knowledge you bring to the table. So definitely, you know, just keep, uh, keep circling the wagons, keep focused on it. And it, it's not all about spending millions and millions of dollars. Unfortunately, this stuff is very expensive, mm -hmm. but not everything requires a silver bullet to address. So slowly chipping away at it, um, your, your security posture will get better, but you need to stay focused Keep measuring, keep chipping and marching ahead. Great stuff, Tom. Thanks so much for your time today. I think people are really going to enjoy this. Thank you. It was great being here. <laughs>